Our text for meditation this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 19, selected verses. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand in the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Your fellow believers in Christ, I think all of us here know what a fire exit is. Fire exits are now something that is required by law for a public building like a library or a bank or something like that. And it is a designated door or area where if there's a problem, you can get out through there. We cry, required by law a designated area to get out in case there's an issue. You have the same thing in planes. For those of you who've flown, you know what I'm talking about. On a plane, they'll always have that emergency exit door. And the flight attendants will always come out and say, if you are not comfortable with the responsibility of opening that door, we'll switch seats with someone. Fire exits. Emergency. Basically, all these things are is they're escape routes. It's pretty much what they are. And that's smart. That's a smart thing. We live in a world where we cannot predict everything that's going to happen. We cannot predict if there's going to be a fire or a disaster or a problem. So the best we can do is try to point out ahead of time a clear escape route, a clear exit. Brothers and sisters, in our text for this morning, God gives purely out of love. He gives to Lot and his family an escape route. He gives them a fire exit, literally a fire exit, purely out of love. But here's the thing. The Lord delivers Lot in spite of Lot's best efforts to the contrary. The Lord delivers Lot and his family out of there. He saves them despite their best efforts to the contrary. He saves them in spite of themselves. And that is so important for us to remember. Because he does the same thing for us. I tell you this morning that your salvation is firm and your deliverance is certain despite your best efforts. Your deliverance is certain because it rests on him, not on you. Their salvation is certain because it rests on him, not on you. Now as we start to look at our text, we are in the season of Advent. Today begins the season of Advent where we look back to when Jesus was born in a manger and we look forward to when he will come again. And at first glance, this text really doesn't seem to fit, does it? I mean, this is Genesis. 
that doesn't really seem to fit the Christmas season. But as you look at it, it actually fits very well. Because the whole point of this text, everything that's going on here, is that God is coming down to earth and saving. That's what he does here. He comes down and he saves. That's Christmas in a nutshell. Exactly what he did at Christmas. He came down to earth and he started saving. So the text, it actually matches very well with Christmas. It matches very well with this season. In our text, God had decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He had had enough, and their wickedness had reached high enough, so he decided to destroy them. He also decided, out of love, to save Lot and his family. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And so to do this, God sent two angels, who they were disguised, appeared as men. He sent two angels into Sodom to get Lot and his family out of there. And already I'm going to ask you a question. How hard can it possibly be to get people out of a city that they know is going to be destroyed? How hard can that possibly be? Well, it turns out it was fairly difficult. In our text, what happens we're actually right before our text is the angels get to Sodom, and the men of Sodom gather around Lot's house, and they want him to bring out these two men. They thought they were men, and the men of Sodom were going to abuse them in more ways than one. So the angels struck the men of Sodom with blindness. Now while that's happening, the angels who are in the house turn to Lot and they say, is there anybody else besides who's in your house that you need or who's in your family to get out of town? And Lot says, well, I have two sons-in-law. In the verse right before our text, in verse 14, Lot goes and talks to his sons-in-law. I'm going to read it and pay close attention because this verse gives us a very strong clue about the spiritual situation of Lot. Just how far, how much his faith had weakened. Genesis verse 14 so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Why? They honestly thought that he was joking, that he was pulling a prank, and why? Why? I told you that this verse gives us a good indication of Lot's spiritual state. And I know, it's not obvious right away when you just hear it. It's not obvious. But think of it this way. Let's say you have a man, and he has a son, and he decides to raise his son so that they're best buds. Instead of, instead of being a figure of authority and teaching for his son, he decides we're going to be best buds. So he hangs out with him like he's a buddy. He takes him to video game arcades or, when the boy gets older, not old enough, he takes him to bars and drinks with him. And then the dad will take him out hunting or fishing and stuff. And every time they go anywhere, the dad's always driving 30 miles per hour over. You know, they hang out together, they drink, they tell dirty jokes, things that good old boys do. Just hanging out. Now imagine that that's the relationship between that father and son. And then suddenly one day the dad decides to say to the son, Hey, by the way, you shouldn't speed. That's against the law. How would the son react? He'd probably laugh. He'd be like, Are you serious? You've got to be making a joke. This is our thing, dad. We do this all the time. He'd think it was a joke. What does this tell you about the spiritual state of Lot? He had been living in Sodom so long. His faith had grown so weak. His morals had been so corrupted that apparently the other Sodomites just thought, him as, thought of him as one of the boys. He does what we do. So the second he actually tries to tell the truth, they think he's joking. They honestly think that he's joking. 
We know that Lot was a believer from 2 Peter chapter 2, but his faith had become so weakened by living in Sodom that they didn't believe him at all. They thought he was joking when he was telling the truth. So that happens. Lot goes back into his house. The sons-in-law aren't coming. And then something else happens, which gives us another indication. Verses 15 and 16. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. So, with the coming of dawn, basically, Lot spent the whole night haggling and delaying. He and his family hesitate again. The angels have to actually physically grab them and pull them out of there. That's what they have to do. Then, once they actually get out onto the plane, something else happens. It's hard to see in your bulletin because if you'll notice, our text stops at verse 17 and then starts at verse 23. We cut out the, the verses in there. But if you'll notice, at the end of verse 17, it says, the angel told them, flee to the mountains. But when you get to verse 23, where does Lot go? He goes to Zoar. Zoar is not the mountains. What happens is when they get out on the plane, Lot and his family look and they're like, we, don't, we can't make it to the mountains. We don't want to do this. Can we just go to Zoar, this little town over here that is like really similar to the place we just left? And the angel's like, fine, whatever. Go there. Just get over there. Lot still won't go where God told him to go, and he haggles and negotiates again. Then the final thing that you heard in our text is right before they get into Zoar, Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. And many have asked why. Why did God give such a harsh punishment for that? And I can tell you that it was not, God did not punish her because of the physical act of looking back. It was because by looking back, she was saying, I wish we never had left. I regret leaving my life in Sodom. I wish I had not come. I want to go back. Brothers and sisters, as you look at these verses and you look at these things one after another, I'll ask you again. How hard can it possibly be to get people out of a city that they know is going to be destroyed? Why is this so difficult here? They keep dragging their feet. They keep hesitating. They keep looking back. I mean, by the way Lot and his family respond to this, you'd have thought that the angels had asked them to do something impossible like tap dance on ice while juggling knives or something. They do not respond well to this. They don't want to do it. How hard can this possibly be? And yet they drag their feet, they backpedal, they keep looking back instead of trusting in God's promise. Well, do we ever do that? Do we ever end up doing that? Or the real question is, when it, when, God, when it comes to God's promises, do we ever backpedal? Do we ever drag our feet and keep one eye looking down here? I know it's not exactly the same. God has never specifically promised us that he's going to like destroy Milwaukee so we have to get out. He's never done that. But God has given us very specific promises. And he has told us how he wants us to act on them. God has specifically promised us that he is our God and he wants us to love him with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. He has specifically promised us that he has saved us by his son's blood and he expects us to believe that and make that the center of our life. 
God has specifically promised us that whenever we come together around word and sacrament, there he grants us life and salvation. And so he wants us to do that regularly. He has specifically promised us that he's going to come back on the last day and he wants us to be waiting and ready. God has given us promises and he wants us to take them seriously. And yet if we're being honest with ourselves, we'd have to admit that many, 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 many times we are guilty of dragging our feet, backpedaling, Looking back and keeping one eye fixed on the here and now, the things of this world. We are all guilty of this. And here's the thing about it. You need no better example of this than the season of Christmas. The modern season of Christmas. If you ever want a hint on how the world works or how Satan operates, look at what has happened to the season of Christmas. Originally, as God gave it to us, Christmas is when the Son of God, who had all things by right, gave them up so that he could become man and be born in a barn to save us. Can you think of anything more anti-materialistic than that? That he would become one of us to grant us joy and hope and peace. That is what God gave us in Christmas, and look at what it has become. If you gather together a group of social scientists and ask them, could you please make a season of the year that is hyper-hectic, super materialistic, everyone's stressed out, nobody's sleeping well, and everyone's running around like a chicken with their head cut off, they'd say, we don't have to do that. It's called December. That is what we have turned this time into. The exact opposite of what God gave us. And this latches on to us. The truth is that, like Lot, we are often guilty, very, very often guilty, of backpedaling, of dragging our feet when it comes to God's promises, of looking back at the stuff of this world and the here and now instead of focusing on what God has promised us in his son Jesus. We are guilty of this many times over. And yet, dear friends, for a very specific reason, God names himself as the Savior. He calls himself the Savior, the Saving One, because that is what he does. And I will let you in on a little hint, a little secret here. He's really, really good at it. Our God is really good at saving. I mean, look at Lot here. If left to his own devices, Lot would have bungled this thing into oblivion. They never would have gotten out of there. And so God stepped in, grabbed him by the wrist, and ripped him out of there. He saved him in spite of himself. You and I, we all have enemies that we never could have defeated. Sin, death, hell, and the devil. And our best efforts would have done nothing. We never could have defeated them. And so God did. And as his son died on the cross and shed his blood for our sins, and when, he, when, G, when you were baptized and Jesus poured his blood all over you, in that moment he grabbed you by the wrist and ripped you out of your, their hands. He ripped you out of the arms of your enemies. He claimed you so that they cannot get their paws on you anymore. That is what our Savior does. Brothers and sisters, just like with Lot, your deliverance is certain and firm because it doesn't rest on you. It rests on him. Finally, dear friends, as we journey toward Christmas this season, 
as we journey towards Bethlehem, don't drag your feet. Don't backpedal. Don't keep looking back at the here and now. I know it's hard. I know. But remember, your salvation is firm because of him. Your deliverance is certain despite your best efforts. Your deliverance is certain because of him. <coughs> the one who calls himself the Savior. He is our de deliverance, and he is our salvation. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>